are similar, called gene family. You refer to homologous genes in a row as parologous genes, or even in separate genes in the genome, you can have multiple clusters of the same genes or multiple members of the same gene all over the genome, you would still call those paralogs. You call any two genes that are similar to each other this umbrella term called homologs. So anything that's similar is homologous, and we call them homologs. Things that clearly came from the same type of family are called paralogs. So for example, beta-anergic receptor has some faint homology to odorant receptors. We would call that homologous gene. However, odorant receptors are a family of 1,000 genes. We would tend to call those paralogs. If you have a gene in the same position in the genome in another organism, so what we refer to that as syntony, for some of you who may not know, have never heard that term before, syntony. <coughs> syntony is the process by which we take two organisms worth of genomic DNA, for example, let's call this mouse and call this rat, and we look at how the alignment of the genes are. <coughs> this array of genes, A, B, C, D. This is an array of genes, A, B, C, D. And these would have some homology to one another. And in fact, if A were to line up with A here on the rat genome, we would call that orthologous. So we're going to draw this again example again, and now we have A for mouse, rat, B, so here I've switched A and D, so now A doesn't line up with B. B does line up with C. C does line up with C across genomes. Depending upon the degree of homology, it gets harder and harder to tell who's who, but you would clearly say that these two are orthologous to each other. However, notice that A here, while its best homolog is over here, it's not perfectly aligned. And just because it's not perfectly aligned, one is resi resistant to call it an ortholog. Even if, for example, the amount of amino acid homology between these two are, let's say, 85%, and even this is 85% homologous to this, just because it's not, not lined up over it, we no longer refer to it as an ortholog. We call it a homolog. And it's, it's sort of, and I, I'll tell you part of the reason why that's true is because there's something called gene conversion that goes on in your genome. Well, the book touches upon that in, in, a, in a material I won't go over in class. I really encourage you to read about gene conversion. And the reason why gene conversion can screw up all concepts of orthologous relationships is, for example, if you look at this particular set of genes, and let's say we were also going to look at the promoter regions. And so this region, this, this region here is homologous to this region here. And this region here is homologous to this region here. This is here, this is here, this is here, this is here. Plus, we have B and C. Now it gets more difficult. We are, uh, whereas this is not homologous to this, not homologous. So that means that, in fact, the chromosome arrangement is correct. But something happened that shifted A and D in the rat chromosome. So because of that, 
one is very reluctant to say A and A are orthologous, but in fact, these parts of the genome are similar between A and B. In fact, these are the genes that are, are actually come from a common ancestry, but somehow the coding sequence was swapped. So it gets very, very difficult to be absolutely sure what's an ortholog. And we do our best, we, we line up the, the genomes, and we make our best guess of what is an orthologous gene. They're certainly all homologs of each other. If I tell you A and B and C and D are all homologous to each other, then certainly D, B, A, and C are also homologous to each other and to the mouse. But to call something an ortholog is a very, very special definition. So, as I said, it can get horrifically complicated, um, this process. So, to be considered an ortholog, you need to be in synthesis with the other genes. That is correct. Yes. So when you, when you go to line up the two different genomes, what do you use as a starting So, one of the things that I didn't tell you which um, you, some of you may know if you, first of all, rat and mouse have a different number of chromosomes. So already you know that the chromosomes don't perfectly align. One of the things that you'll see, for example, if you look at, let's say, chromosome two of mouse, you'll see that this portion here, now this is chromosome two. Let's, let's do hashes, let's do some verticals, horizontal, blank, and let's say go. You can actually find this whole part of mouse chromosome two, perhaps somewhere along chromosome nine of rat. It can be in the inverse order, as you might have thought it should look like, relative centromere telomere. This part here could be on chromosome 11 in rat. This part could be on another chromosome, this part could be on another chromosome, and this part can be on another chromosome. So there are all these maps which line up big chunks of genomic DNA as best as they can with other regions of other chromosomes. All the chromosomes are completely mixed up between rat, mouse, and human, although huge chunks, megabases, are kept in symphony with each other. But there are breaks, and there are breaks where we're in part because we're full of repetitive DNA. Yeah? So for it to be the ortholog, it has to be on the same chromosome? No. So those are orthologs. So the genes that would be in here, as long as they're in, in registry, would be orthologs. That's correct. This is a micro look at within a small part of genomic DNA. This is a macro look at hundreds of genes. But if you now go micro, even in the micro look of this macro, you can have non-orthologous genes, even though it looks like they reside right next to each other. As I said, and it can get very, very complicated. And I encourage you to read the gene conversion part. So there, there are these gene families which which are all over the genome. And um, in fact, the ribosomal RNAs are also part of gene family. There's something called pseudogenes in the genome. And this is actually, a, uh, I'm, oft, I'm often debating the concept of pseudogene with colleagues all the time. Pseudogenes are defined sort of as non-functional genes. And the way they've been defined as non-functional genes is the RNAs have stop codons in them, so therefore they don't make proteins as you might imagine they should make a protein. And remember what I've just told you. I've just told you they look like they should have, they're homologous to other genes usually, but they look truncated because of these aberrant stop codons. You see the, the DNA complexity is different from a protein coding gene. So you start thinking that it's not a functional gene. The transcription unit may not work. Therefore, it could be completely silent transcriptionally. And one refers to these general categories of genes 
that look like essentially genes that used to exist that have somehow been destroyed over time and are not functional. However, to prove something is a pseudogene requires you to knock it out somehow or destroy it completely from the genome to absolutely prove something is a non-functional gene. Just because it doesn't make a protein doesn't automatically make it a non-functional gene. And just because it doesn't make an RNA doesn't mean it's a non-functional piece of genomic DNA. So a, the, the concept of pseudogene is very complicated. For this class, it's good enough you know it as something that looks like it should have made a protein, but it doesn't because it didn't make an RNA, or it doesn't make, uh, uh, doesn't look like it makes a protein that's translationally complex, has no homology to anything, has um, stop codons all over the place that looks like it has reading frames, but it goes out of frame all of, all of, all of the time. So one of the things that's really important you understand, and I said this to you already, your genomes are full of repetitive DNA as well as non-repetitive <coughs> DNA. Well, the repetitive DNAs happen to be really good places for crossing over to occur. In fact, crossing over can occur within the coding sequences of your gene as well. So for example, here is um, crossing over, of course, <coughs> occurs during meiosis. And what happens is, is you've now duplicated your genome. And what happens is, is that, let's say this is your maternal copy and your paternal copy. You've duplicated it, so you're 4N. And somehow, which we'll describe later in molecular detail, you get a chiasm formed between this allele, this chromosome, and this chromosome. And you get what's called a crossover. And in fact, what you do is you end up putting some of your paternal allele um, or maternal allele in line with your paternal allele and vice versa. So that you get what's called crossing over, and then you get segregation, so this could end up in one cell, and this would end up in another cell. Or, or this would end up in one cell, and that would end up in another cell. So you can get all kinds of variations, and if you don't realize it, crossing over happens all over your genome during meiosis, so you're quite a bit mixed up from your parental DNA, from your parental DNA. You don't actually inherit the, a collinear set of DNA from either parent except the Y chromosome. Because the Y chromosome has very little to undergo recombination with on the X chromosome. It doesn't really pair well with the X chromosome, and there's very, very little meiotic recombination. I alluded to this once before, that you can track um, the heredity of male offspring by looking at the DNA the exact nucleotide content of the Y chromosome because it rarely varies. So this is essentially what it looks like. You have homologous sequences here. They pair, there's a break. There's a strand invasion from one strand into the other. So the blue strand invades here, the red strand invades here, and you fix this break such that now you have a crossover and remember, these are crossing over occurs in regions of identical nucleotides. So in fact, while you can see in this cartoon, which is the parental and, and um, which strand is parental, in fact, these are perfectly homologous sequences. So this is really where um, crossing over hurts you in a big way. How, yes? because you take with it the rest of the chromosomes. Okay. So those two match up particularly when they bring The whole chromosome comes with it. Okay. So here's a nice example of it. So for example, um, you can have nice equal crossover where you align and you just cross over and you, you donate your distal end of your chromosome to one of the other chromosomes. However, if you have repetitive structures, for example here, a, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, and this is all repeated, you can get what's called unequal crossing over. You don't match properly. The, the, the alignment of the DNA 
doesn't know it made a mistake in how it aligned during the crossover process. So in fact, what happened is, is they were slightly offset, and in one case, the crossover made one chromosome larger, and in the other case, in the, uh, and the resolved chiasm makes this one shorter. So you can actually grow a number of genes and reduce number of genes. This is actually probably a real problem with disease nowadays because it, we're starting to think about, in fact, gene copy numbers as influential, influential in disease. So having more than one copy of a particular gene can give you a disease. They're totally wild type. You just have two copies on one chromosome and one on another. So this is a could be this is our people think some of these gene duplication diseases, as they're called, are might be involved in schizophrenia, for example. They're very hard to find. They are absolutely not mutant genes. Yes? Does crossing over the, the chiasm almost always form in the middle of repetitive sequences? No, in, I said repetitive sequences are lower the genome and are highly homologous. But they can also happen within the gene as well. Anywhere where there's homologous sequences. But repetitive DNA happens to be quite homologous and, makes, to, it and makes it easier to find. But it happens all over the place. I actually don't care to give a number of how many of these crossing over occurs during meiosis, but I would be willing to bet thousands per chromosome it happens. And this is a single crossover. Of course, you can get a double crossover where you have a crossover event here and then have another crossover again and have a double crossover event. So it happens quite prolific. So for example, here, if you look at this here, we have now deleted some genome <coughs> DNA and we've repeated it. It's having two copies of, for example, let's say this is an extra copy of cat here. Is it mutant? Is that extra copy mutant? So there will be one nucleotide that will not work, that you might be able to tell that you have two wild type genes, but that could happen in a repetitive sequence somewhere. That one nucleotide would, so for example, here it's perfect as it was in the original. The only thing that makes, the only way you even know you have a duplication would be if, hypothetically if you could see the BC break here that was maybe a, there's a nucleotide difference. Otherwise, you wouldn't even know. So basically, it becomes a disease of dosage. It becomes a disease of dosage. That's correct. <laughs> Which is, they're thinking that this is much more prolific than we thought in the past. Yeah? Is it possible to mention fragile X? Oh, well, the fragile X is that case, but there's a, what's called a CAG repeat within the gene, and it's a, it expands through unequal crossover um, in part. And that causes you to have fragile But that is one of the ways that happens. So it, it's important. And one of the, you know, this happens quite a bit. And this actually um, happens in many regions, in satellite, many satellite DNA. Um, and you can have an unequal crossover that actually gain new genes in a particular cluster. So here's. Here's what I showed you before. Essentially, you could have a combination, or you can have unequal, com unequal crossover, and now one cluster of genes has now gone from two gene members to three gene members. And the other side got <laughs> screwed. It went from three to one. And let's say this one dies, so therefore you never see it, so you've expanded um, your genes from two to three in a particular population. So where you can see that very clearly is in the immune system. I'm not in the immune system, in the blood system. So for example, different thalassemias have occurred. Thalassemia is, um, actually I don't know what thalassemia stands for. Thalassemia. What is thal? Thalassemia, M-I is blood. Okay, so blood disease, I guess? It's around the Mediterranean, that's why they call it. So, um, so you can have unequal crossover that takes out different parts of the gene. So here, you took out alpha 2. This is, 
the alpha, alpha, blood, alpha globin blood cluster, there are three pseudogenes and three normal genes and, a, and four normal genes. And if you have an unequal crossover, you can delete, for example, alpha two, you can delete alpha one, you can delete much more, and all of these disease, and you can actually spot the diseases um, well, that are caused by these deletions. One of the reasons blood disorders are so well studied is because people come to the doctor and present very clearly, I can't, I have trouble breathing. And since blood was such an easy tissue to study, it was one of the earliest studies. So in fact, in terms of blood diseases, I think we know, I don't know, somewhere about 5,000 different mutations that affect the globin clusters. So we're just, we know every, we know so much about how, what mutations affect the blood, the, the globin, the alpha and the beta globin clusters that um, it's, it becomes easier and easier to study. But as you'll see, it's a horrendously difficult cluster to study. So for example, here, this is the beta globin cluster. And you can see also, again, a deletion series that give different thalassemias. So they're, they're, so you can see they all have their different names associated with them. Um, a condition which there is dis, dis, a proportionate amount of the abnormal tetramer beta 4, relative to the amount of normal hemoglobin. Therefore, I, if you don't know, hemoglobin is an alpha 2 beta 2. Um, configuration of protein, and depending on how much protein you make of any particular subunit, you can affect the disease as well. So this is what the history, so what people have proposed by looking at the alpha beta globin genes, alpha beta globin genes, um, throughout all species, throughout many species. So for example, if you look at mammals, so here we're gonna look at um, look at mammals, and this is the alpha cluster, the beta cluster, and actually they reside on different genomes, different chromosomes, I should say. Here's the chicken beta cluster, here's the xenopus, which is frog, beta cluster, and alpha cluster. Notice in xenopus, the alpha beta cluster is linked to each other, and they're not on separate chromosomes. And same to zebra fish, yes? It sounds like there are multiple clusters within a family, but what defines, you know, what makes one cluster another if they're all within the same family? <coughs> they reside on different chromosomes. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So you can see, because you can find alpha and beta on the same chromosome length, and you can see them interspersed as well, you can see there probably was some kind of ancestral alpha, alpha, beta, beta, which also probably just came from a single alpha or single beta. As you know, muscle only makes my, um, myoglobin, which is an, also a homologue of beta globin. So it all came from one ancestral type of globin. You can see that it was very easy. You got split off of the beta and the alpha, and the alpha and human and beta are in separate chromosomes. You can do your dot matrix plot and compare, for example, this is the mouse in human beta globin cluster, and you can see how you can clearly see that you have promoter homology in the locus control region. It's called the locus control region in, um, for this cluster for reasons that you'll see very shortly. There are the different genes and um, even the pseudogenes have homology. So here, a pseudogene has homologies to all the subunits. And so you can see very clearly in this dot matrix plot all the genes and all the exon homologies quite easily. And you can look at the study of the globin cluster in, in terrific detail. And what you find is that, um, let's just look at the human one particularly. E stands for embryonic, F stands for fetal, and A stands for adult. You have several different forms of globin, each with their own capacity to bind oxygen. So early in life, you have an embryonic <coughs> form of globin, 
which then gets switched to a fetal, which then gets switched to an adult. And as you might realize, you're not making the embryonic and you're not making the fetal an adult, and in fact they have a common they have a common enhancer, and what happens is you cycle through them over time from this common enhancer. And that common enhancer is referred to as a local locus control region. So again, this is a reiteration of what I told you. Not only do you have this event happen for the beta globin genes, you have it happen for the alpha globin genes as well. You have their chromosome. Here you have a locus control region regulating the, the beta globin region. You can see embryonically, you have the embryonic form uh, along with, the, I think this is zeta, uh, um, part of my Greek. Um, this is the alpha form. You have a couple of different ones and they associate with the globin, the, the fetal form. <coughs> Finally, you have the adult forms and there are a couple of different adult forms. So this is generically how one cycles through the genes to make globin during life. And this is how the locus control region works. Initially during fetal development, the locus control region <coughs> regulates the, the fetal forms, for example, and if you, you have high expression of this particular gene called FOP, um, and high expression of TLF1, <coughs> you now trigger expression of two other genes, which now switch the LCR to not look at the, the fetal forms, but to only activate the adult forms. So this is fairly generic. I'm not asking you to memorize this, but for those of you who are interested, you can go through the different types of transcription factors and how they work. This is, um, this is again just a um, reiteration of some of the molecules that I think, uh, some of the genes in the cluster. And just to remind you, when we look at these clusters like this, we are no longer looking at them as exons. So right, this is not exon one, two, three, four. We're looking at the actual, the whole cluster of exons grouped together, and they just refer to it as the beta globin gene here. But in fact, of course, it's full of exons, it splices rather nicely, makes an RNA, and of course makes you a protein. This is what it looks like when you do homology profiles and look through cross species. What you can see there are bits of conservation. Some of those will be in the coding sequences. Some will be in the LCR sequences. This is um, some regulatory potential. This is some other bioinformatics software to look at what could be a regulatory domain. Here are homologous sequences. And of course, the higher the peak, the more the homology cross species. You can now break that down into nucleotide level, for example. So now this is looking at human, chimp, Reese's, mouse, rat, dog, cow, armadillo, elephant, possum, chicken, and Xenopus tropicalis which is a frog. And you can see, look at the conservation shown in the black humps and the, and the conservation here. And through transcription factor databases, you can assign what transcription factors you think would bind to those particular locations. This is the direction of the transcription. And then you can make models like this, where you can say, this is the basal promoter. I'll just be a couple more minutes. This is the basal promoter of it. You can look now further upstream to see other regions and you can find all the conservations you want. You notice here these are mutations that have been found in particular different beta thalassemias. And you can see that they land right in some of the genes. So obviously those are important genes. And I encourage you, you can look at, uh, oops, I'm going the wrong way. So you can look at upstream regions. You can also find that transcription factor site. You can look in the three prime enhancers. You see there are needles in haystack, these, these, these enhancer binding sites. They're very, very difficult to find. You notice the conservation DNA binding domains are very small, six to eight nucleotides long. They're extremely hard to find. You need a lot of data to, to, to find those things. It helps to have mutational data as well. So and finally, this is what some more distal regions look like. This is how people put together enhancer complexes that regulate the gene array that you saw. 
So I'm just going to leave you there and see you next.